Today's episode is brought to you by Canby Foursquare Church. Since 1978, a place to grow, connect, and serve. In-person services are back with some restrictions to help ensure everyone stays safe and healthy. For the latest, visit their website at canbyfoursquare.com. Welcome to Now Hear This Can Be, your source for news. The threat of a possible teacher strike was avoided this week. There's a new irresistibly cute creature winning over fans, and its name is Scootaloo. Sports? It's like Lucy in the football. You want to kick a field goal, but they take it away from you. We had to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. Goal can't be in the last second of the game! And interesting conversations. Because I'm one of the strongest girls ever, and I know that for a fact. I just really enjoy writing gossip as if I was a bear. <laughs> With an old maid daughter that make the best moonshine in the coast. <laughs> and if you would hit me in the face, I think I would have died. I really do. It, it, it... I guarantee you would have died, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Hey friends, and welcome to Now Hear This Can Be Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I'm James Walton, and this is what's happening this week in our community. Clackamas County commissioners have moved their meetings to online only for the foreseeable future after some people in the crowd at last week's session refused to follow county and state public health rules and became so disruptive that board chair Tootie Smith worried they would turn violent. Smith said in a statement to media outlets that she had made a point to hold in-person commission meetings since taking office in January of 2021, but felt the aggressive energy at last week's hearing was palpable and disturbing. As the meeting began, Smith pounded her gavel from behind the dais and strictly admonished the audience of about 60 people to put on masks. About a third of them were not wearing masks initially, she later estimated, though a later shot of the crowd from the county's broadcast showed that most complied with her request. If you don't like it, you will be escorted out and or I will cancel this meeting and we will not have it in person, Smith told the crowd. I will not argue, I will cancel the meeting or you will be removed. Things went off the rails less than 20 minutes in as Commissioner Martha Schrader was attempting to reinforce the importance of wearing masks and following public health protocols. Thanks for telling folks they need to wear masks. That's a good thing, Schrader said to jeers from several in the audience. No, everyone, let's not get hostile tonight, she continued. Now, there's too much energy. Let's just be kind to one another. Everybody's upset. It's a hard week. It's a hard two years. Let's just give each other some grace and space, okay? We're going virtual, online. We're canceling the meeting, Smith announced before scolding the crowd. I warned you, I asked for you to observe decorum. <laughs> Pathetic, one woman declared on the county's broadcast of the brief meeting, while a man's voice shouted, Are you going to spew your propaganda all night? Both the county's broadcast, as well as a live-streamed video from the anti-mandate organization Free Oregon that shows the group continuing to hold their own impromptu meeting for at least 30 minutes after commissioners and staff vacated the room, appear to capture a relatively restrained and compliant crowd, albeit ones with different ideas about COVID, than the CDC and public health officials. But on Tuesday, Smith shared alarming context that she claims suggested some members of the crowd may have had violent intentions. Smith told the Oregonian that a staffer later informed her that people in the back of the room had been overheard saying, get ready, let's take the dais, we're going to storm it. She described the incident as a, quote, attempted insurrection and told the other media outlets she feared the crowd would become violent. They removed masks, called names, and wielded accusations at me and my fellow commissioners, she said. While I've always supported choice for people to manage their own health care and have had said so many times publicly, this group of individuals blamed our local commission for all the state mandates Governor Brown has issued. They knew better. She said she understands some people's frustration over Brown's indoor mask mandate amid what feels like a never-ending pandemic. But as the chair of the Board of Commissioners, it's her responsibility to keep the meetings professional, protect public safety, and avoid what could be sizable fines if the county refused to enforce the state's masked guidelines. 
As a leader of Clackamas County, I do not want my government to be levied a $500 per person fine, she said. In attendance at this meeting were 60 people, and the resulting fine would have been $30,000 of taxpayer money for the first offense. Smith said county commissioners are going to, quote, play it by ear and measure the temperature as the meetings go virtual this week and next. People can sign in to the meetings via Zoom, as has been an option for participants for nearly two years since the pandemic began. Oregon State Troopers are investigating a suspected hit and run that left a 30-year-old Milwaukee man dead on the side of Highway 99E in the Kanema area Sunday morning. Canby resident Ed Grotsky was on his way to deliver donuts to 8th Creek Christian Fellowship in West Lynn at approximately 7 a.m. when he noticed what he thought was a pile of blankets or a sleeping bag in a southbound pullout. Passing by the same location on his way home approximately 45 minutes later, he saw the lump was still there and stopped to investigate. Sadly, he discovered a lifeless body surrounded by broken glass. There was also a single sandal lying in the middle of the road, Grotsky later recounted. He called 911 and stayed on scene according to the dispatcher's instructions. Oregon City Police, the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office, and other emergency personnel responded to the scene with state troopers at about 7.45 a.m. OSP is taking lead in the investigation, police said. Highway 99E was closed for several hours Sunday as investigators worked to reconstruct the scene. The deceased was struck by an unknown vehicle and sustained fatal injuries, according to Trooper's preliminary investigation. He was later identified as Marcos Pinto Balam, 30, of Milwaukee. ODOT and the Clackamas County Medical Examiner's Office also assisted on the scene. Oregon City Police are on the lookout for a man who robbed two coffee stands at gunpoint Saturday night while wearing a heavily taped motorcycle helmet as a disguise. The suspect's first hit was at the Black Rock Coffee on the 1800 block of Malala Avenue at approximately 7.20 p.m. A half hour later, he robbed the Dutch Bros on Main Street in downtown Oregon City. In both cases, the man appeared at the walk-up window, brandished what appeared to be a handgun, and demanded money from the employees. He was described as a male between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10 in height and wearing a black jacket with white writing, a gray hooded sweatshirt, black pants, and black shoes. His most distinctive feature was the black motorcycle helmet adorned with an X marked in white tape and black mesh to obscure his face, similar to a fencing helmet or, as one commenter pointed out on the OCPD Facebook post, the sinister masks worn by guards in the hit Netflix survival drama Squid Game. In that same post, an employee of Keller Coffee Company in Milano said they were also robbed around 8 a.m. Saturday morning and that it appeared to have been perpetrated by the same suspect. Authorities did not say how much cash the bandit made away with in the string of robberies. For photos of the suspect, you can find the story on our website, canbefirst.com. Cougar Country Hometown Sports Coverage is brought to you by Reif and Hunsaker PC. When you need an attorney, turn to the firm Canby has trusted for over 50 years. Call them today at 503-266-3456. And for the latest sports news, follow us on Twitter at Cougar Country OR and Instagram at Cougar Country Pod. After an impressive 6-3 non-league start to the Canby Cougars girls' basketball season, first-year head coach Ingrid McCoy had staked her reputation on one thing, stingy defense. The Cougars utilized the press and active hands to force turnovers and stymie offense. Through their first nine games, Canby had allowed more than 50 points only once and held opponents under 38 points five separate times. But against a dynamic St. Mary's Academy team on Wednesday, the Cougars' defense faltered in their first three Rivers League game. The Blues scored at will en route to a 75-49 victory in Canby. 
McKenna Kraft led the Cougars with 15 points and three steals on the night, while post Michaela Ford had five assists. With the Tiger Tualatin School District shifting all classes to online learning, the girls' Friday night matchup, along with the boys against Tualatin, was postponed to February 23rd. The postponement allowed the girls more time to recoup and practice. We really focused on keeping our spirits up and taking it one day at a time, McCoy told Now Here This Can Be. It's hard to have games canceled and the possibility that it could continue to happen. We will practice through it and keep moving forward as a team. In wrestling news, can be dominated a shorthanded Lake Oswego squad last week, winning all but one match on the way to a 69-6 victory. We had a great duel against Lake Oswego, head wrestling coach Jeremy Ensrud said. Lake Oswego gave us a couple of tough matches, but our depth was too much for them. Lake Oswego was able to bring only six wrestlers to the meet due to illness and COVID protocols, leaving most of Canby's deep, experienced squad to win by forfeit. Seven Cougars, including undefeated senior Ty Ewers, had no opponent to face on Thursday. Of the six matches that took place, Canby won five. Matthew Young, Thomas Marquez, Ethan Ensrud, and Jackson Doman won by fall, while Zach Netter took down Reese Hingricks as the best matchup of the day, winning by an 11 by nine decision. William Dolan was the lone Laker to earn a victory on the afternoon, pinning Camby's Jonathan Cruz. And that'll do it for sports and the news on this episode of Now Hear This Camby. As always, thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the episode and have a great day. And now, a message from Donna Ellison of Ellison Team Homes. Hi, everyone. I wanted to take this moment to invite you personally to come and hang out with us for our end-of-season client event. It's a thank you to all the wonderful people we've done business with, as well as a welcome to a lot of our community. Um, I'm doing this in partnership with Vanessa Zimmerman, Zimmerman team at Academy Mortgage. It's um, just kind of our way of saying thank you. We really enjoyed uh, getting to know you, doing business with you, etc. We'll be outside. We're sensitive to the fact that we're in COVID, um, still dealing with that. So it will be spread out. People will have room to breathe and sit and walk and talk. Reckless Company, if you've never heard them before, they're awesome. They're going to be playing. Uh, we'll have TMK here. I can't wait to try the corn dog. I've been waiting like two years to try this corn dog. So um, it looks amazing, and I've heard it's amazing, and I think there's quite a following. Also, they'll have all kinds of other food. We'll have beer and cider. Everything's hosted, of course, as a thank you. Again, it's for our clients. It's for our community. We really, really want to come and celebrate. We'll have swag for you, all kinds of fun things for the kids. We hope to see you on 916 from 4 to 8 in the afternoon. And welcome back to the ad sponsor section where I get to talk to people about books because I always drag Megan Waterman in here to be with me. Hi, Megan. Hi. That's, that's not a bad thing. Talking about books is always the best time. I think you know of all people that I can talk about books endlessly. Um, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, Megan, do you want to tell our listeners about what's going on down at the Book Nook? Oh, um, at the Book Nook, we are getting ready for the holidays. Yeah. I know. There's only one I care about. And by the time this ad comes out, it's basically over. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you talking about Halloween? Yeah, I, I like spooky, scary stories. I know you do. We've got a lot of great spooky, scary stories in right now. Yeah, yeah. We do, but spooky, scary stories are also good for Christmas. <gasps> do you have a favorite author that writes spooky, scary stories that are I mean, appropriate for Christmas? You, get, you go with your classic Charles Dickens, right? Yep. Some, some uh, Christmas Carol stuff. Absolutely, that's my favorite. That's the best. There's Mr. James. I know about him. He oh, did yeah. a whole series of short, short scary stories for short Christmas. Short scary stories. I don't know. Christmas in general is kind of scary. It depends on <laughs> how many people you have to buy for. <laughs> <laughs> how many people you have to cook dinner for? <laughs> right. Speaking of cooking dinner, Thanksgiving is kept coming up. Thanksgiving is coming. We have got some beautiful cookbooks in recently, and some really cute uh, kids uh, cookbooks just came in. If you want to start cooking with your grandkids or starting to teach uh, train up your little ones to cook Thanksgiving dinner so you can just sit on the couch and watch football and right now is the time to go in right yes because 
waiting until Christmas Eve for that one special book that someone wants isn't going to work. It's not going to be there. This year, it's it's no secret, the last year and a half has been a little crazy for the whole world. And yeah. that is really going to affect Christmas this year. Um, there are going to be serious stock issues this year. Um, so get your Christmas shopping done early. We've been working really hard to get as much inventory on our shelves and in um, our overstock as possible so that we um, have what you want at Christmas time. But uh, if you know now a title uh, that you want to buy for somebody for Christmas, get it now. Because right. it, it might not be... I might not be able to get it later. And what what is our what is all three of ours? Because we also have Amy in the studio with us. What's all three of ours um, this season's book recommendation? Okay. Amy, what's your <laughs> book recommendation for this season? Uh, the night before Christmas. All right. Yeah, that's classic, Megan. And for me, my favorite Christmas read. Oh. Okay, my favorite book that's coming out this is, it's, it's no secret, I am an Outlander fan. I love Diana Gabaldon. There may be a cardboard cutout of Jamie Fraser in our bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> if book boyfriends are a thing. Yeah. Um, and finally, book nine is coming out towards the end of November. So um, you will not see me until I finish reading that. And mine is the Dungeons and Dragons Feast of Legends or whatever, the table... So make sure you guys come on down to Book Nook. Megan, where are you guys located? We are on the corner of Grant and 2nd in downtown Canby. All right. Joining us on the Candy Conversation today, uh, again, it's been a little while, but is Gally Murray. She's the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for Clackamas County. Hi, Gally. Hey, good to see you. Great good to be to back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome back onto the show. Um, how have you been doing? We haven't really talked to you since um, before the pandemic. Obviously, uh, a lot of things have changed for county employees. You said you're in the office today. I'm in the office today. Um and I'm, I'm not in the office very often, but I am in office today. And it's, uh, it's a pretty different uh, world, um, mm-hmm. as, as you know. And, you've, got the, um, you've got the mask on, I see. I've got the, I got the mask on. So yeah. uh, trying to be as clear and articulate as I possibly can through the mask and the you microphone. You sound great. Okay. Um, you know, things are, uh, you know, I, it, it's just a different, it feels like a different world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also being in the county building today after all of the things that are happening locally and the things that are happening in DC, there's yeah. um, increased concerns about security here in the building. And so it's just, um, it's just a very, it's a very different world. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and obviously, you know, germane to the work you do uh, very, very heavy. I imagine a lot of people are, are dealing with stuff today. Um, a I, lot I of mean, folks. In, in this time. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks who are, who are really struggling and we don't oftentimes hear about those folks. Um, there are a lot, a, lot of, a lot of folks that just like me and you who, um, you know, they may have, they may have employment, they may have uh, good health, they may have uh, natural supports in place, but, you know, none of us are, are immune from, from the struggles that have occurred over the last 10 months. Um, so it's been, it's been pretty significant. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you hear about that uh, kind of the second epidemic of mental health crises and depression and suicide. Yeah. I mean, you're in that world um, in your experience here in Clackamas County in our communities. Would you say that that's real? Is that something that is overblown a little bit? I'm not asking you to necessarily say this is the, the percentage more that we're seeing in, in suicides or depression, but um, is, is it a lot worse uh, since the pandemic with the isolation, with some of the job loss and stuff? I appreciate you asking that question because actually what's happened over the past 10 months is that there has been a great deal of misinformation that's been spreading Um and I think it comes from a place of people being, people making some assumptions about what's happening with the suicide numbers and people making some assumptions about what's, what's happening with human beings. And, you know, I do, I do want to say that, you know, human beings are, you know, we are, we, you know, myself included, we are struggling. Um, this is not an easy time. However, the, 
the rate of suicide um, has not gone up as a result of the pandemic. There are many people out there who who have said, well, we've had, you know, as many suicides as we've had COVID deaths. Um, you know, there's been lots of misinformation out there, but it's really important for people to know that the rate, the rate of suicide has not gone up as a result of pandemic. And the, the rate of suicide has not gone up, period. Um, it, it continues to have a trajectory nationally and locally of, of, of going up. That is not new to us as far as the data goes. But I think people are wanting to, to connect death from suicide and pandemic. And that is, that's not accurate. Um, I mean, you know, please know that people are dying. It's not that people are not dying. And one death, as you know, is, is one death is way too many. Um, But there is not uh, there, you know, at this point, there's not a direct connection between between suicide deaths and the pandemic. Yeah, and and, and let's be clear because I, I do hear what you're saying. You're not saying the pandemic has helped. I mean, no, right. Th- there is definitely issues that have come from all this isolations and and the change to daily routines and everything that that so absolutely. many absolutely are dealing with. Um, absolutely. Yeah, and, and but no, you're, you, right. you're saying there was already some some sort of trajectory of suicides that were trending upward pre-pandemic and and you're saying that has continued but we haven't seen a correlative spike that that would suggest it's going up faster correct correct you know and as far as depression and anxiety that you mentioned you know i don't have i don't have the data on that because that's not my that's not my area of expertise to be monitoring however um, anecdotally being around people, you know, Clackamas, Clackamas County operates physical health clinics and behavioral health clinics. We operate an urgent mental health walk-in center. And, you know, I can tell you that we are, we are, we are seeing people, we are open for business, um, you know, whether that's in person or telehealth and, and people are coming in and we're so thankful for that. And people are really struggling and yeah. we're seeing, we're seeing depression, we're seeing anxiety and we're seeing thoughts of suicide. Um, you know, and we're hearing stories of people losing their jobs, people becoming unwell, uh, people getting COVID, people dying from COVID. Um, all of those stories are, are definitely things that, that we are hearing about regularly and trying to support people um, around. Yeah, yeah. One group that I know is really heavy on my heart, and, and I believe a lot of uh, people's, a lot of our listeners as well, is, is our teens, our young people. I think that that's a group that you work with a lot, um, obviously you know, things have changed for all of us. Um, but with the loss of high school, the loss in many ways, the ability to, to see friends and see their support network in the normal ways, loss of sports and extracurriculars, um, school being weird and really different um, during a time when uh, things can be really tough anyway, outside of all of that Absolutely, stuff. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, I know a lot of people are worried about that group. Uh, have you had a lot of experience with how you know, some of them are handling it, obviously, without saying, oh, you know, John Smith it can be. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I can say that, you know, on a on a kind of a, a generalized level, you know, we're seeing we're seeing um, our young people. And when I talk about young people, I'm talking about our K through 12 population and hmm. even our, you know, our college aged, um, our young adults, our youth and um you know, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of of young people really feel disconnected from their community. And, you know, school is a protective factor uh, for so many reasons. You know, school is, you know, not only is a place that people get educated, but it's, you know, it's also a place where, like you mentioned, you get to see your your friends, you get to see supportive adults, you know, you get to engage in um, activities like, you know, PE and other things that might give you some joy uh, for for some students and and maybe not for others, but um, it, 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 you know, we're, we, we have, we have lost a, a, a huge protective factor uh, in our community and, and schools are doing an amazing job of trying to provide that for our, our students through distance learning. But it, you know, as, as you and I know, you know, we're talking over Zoom. It's, it's not the same. It's not the same when you have a virtual world compared to a, 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 a regular f- physical life world. And it's just, it's just, you just can't, it's just hard to replace those things. And I, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of young people say that they, you know, they're missing out on the, the 
every day, like, you know, walking down the halls and hanging out with friends, saying hello to people in the hallway, gathering in the lunchroom or going off campus if they have an open campus. Um, it's the small things like that that people are really are really longing for right now because those were the things that really help promote connection. And when we look at when we look at suicide prevention, we're looking at how how do we promote connection? People always say to me, Gally, you know, and I may have said this to you before, but like, you know, they say to me, Gally, how 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 do I get involved in suicide prevention? How can I be more intentional? And I yeah. always say, yeah, I always say, just you know, start ag- acknowledging the other human beings that are around you. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm not asking you to to do go get your degree or yeah, get licensed. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Asking, I'm just asking you to say good morning, look at people in the eye, and say good morning. Um, how are you doing? Hello. How are you really doing? How are you really doing? If you have time to ask that question and time to stick around for the answer, then yeah, how are you doing? I'm curious to know how you're doing. This has been a really rough, you know, almost year. And for people who say to me, they're doing great. I want to say, really? Are you really doing? I want to kind of poke the bear a little bit. It's like, are you really doing? <laughs> you great? liar. Because no, you're not. <laughs> what's your, what's your, what's your magic? Because I'm not doing great. Yeah. Um, oh man. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's, it's really what, what we can be promoting right now during this time is the same thing that we can be, prom- we, you know, that we, that many of us have talked about 10 months ago. It's connection. And, yeah. and it sounds really cheesy and cliche, but, you know, the, the importance, the importance of, of reaching out to people, not assuming that people have the supports that they, that they, they need or want. Like, you know, oftentimes we make an assumption like, oh, you know, um, so-and-so has a lot of friends, so I'm not going to call them. They're, they've, they've, they've got it dialed in. And it's yeah. like, well, don't. Don't make an assumption that people have the support that they need or want. Reach out to people. And it doesn't have to be a long conversation. It could just be a text message saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. Just remember, just a reminder that I'm here if you ever need anything. I've got, I've got your back. Those are the things that really are, are going to carry us through this pandemic and the potential pandemic, um, you know, on top of a pandemic, which is, you know, mental health related, suicide related. Yeah, yeah. Ali, uh, just coming back to what you were more talking about at the beginning of this conversation, but can you speak at all to the impact that the um, the political unrest and uncertainty that we're seeing, um, the impact that that has on, on on mental health? On I mean, does it have an impact on thoughts of suicide or, or ideation? Um, j- just the that 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 uncertainty, that that difficulty, that strife that um, anger that some people may be feeling that, that maybe they feel that their, uh, that they, that their side was not treated fairly in the election. Maybe they're in that camp. Mm-hmm. That's an awesome question. And so multi-layered, right? So I think about, you know, the impact of, of what's happening around us and, you know, I'm just going to call it what it is, you know, or, you know, racial injustice, um, you know, protests on either side, um, you know, again, you said, you know, there's, there's different sides of the camp, people have different opinions. And, and that absolutely, no matter what side you're on, um, that has an impact on people, particularly people of, you know, uh, BIPOC folks, uh, you know, people of color. When we think about systemic oppression, and racial injustice, and suicide, there is a direct link between those two things that you know when when you are treated differently or or hurt or targeted or even people around you that look like you are killed because of how you look the color of your skin um, that leads to lots of things and that has a direct connection on people's mental health and that has a direct connection to thoughts of suicide people when people consider taking their lives, what the research says very clearly is that people do not want to die necessarily. People want the suffering and the pain to stop and that they have no other way in the moment. They have no other way of thinking about options to make that pain and that suffering stop. And the only option in that moment is to end their life. And so does the, the unrest that we're having locally and nationally, 
contribute to mental health and suicide. Absolutely. You know, it does on a, on a, like a 50,000, you know, global level that as human beings, we can only tolerate so much uh, stimulus, so much unrest, so much conflict, so much um, just turmoil uh, that it impacts us. And, you know, oftentimes with mental health, it doesn't just, it doesn't just show up one day as like, oh, I'm, I'm waking up and I'm feeling depressed or I'm waking up and I'm feeling anxious. It, it shows up sometimes in really subtle ways for folks. Um, You know, maybe they're not wanting to, you know, get out of bed. Maybe they're not wanting to shower or maybe they're not wanting to connect with friends like they were before. Maybe, you know, as a parent, you know, I'm seeing your, your kids in the background. It's like, I'm a parent too. It's like, maybe as a parent, um, we, you know, we're not as active with our children. We're not as engaged. Um, you know, so there are very like subtle ways that it shows up. And, and then there are obviously the more acute ways where it shows up, you know, people having panic attacks, people not being able to get out of bed at all. Um, you know, people, you know, you know really feeling um, so, so upset that they, they, they just can't function. But, you know, I think the, this ha- this has affected people's mental health and as you know mental health is such an invisible thing we talk about our physical health all the time right and it's easy to see when someone is struggling with physical health conditions you have a cough you have a a, a leg or you're limping um you know you have a cast on so there's there's very clear indicators typically when we are physically struggling and people can say oh i hope you feel better it's more kind of accepted in our society. But when people yeah. have when people have mental health um, conditions and they're struggling and they're very subtle, those are oftentimes very invisible. And that's where when I mentioned earlier, when I said it's just really important for us to be connecting with the people in our lives, is that you know, if I'm having subtle symptoms associated with depression and anxiety and no one's connecting with me because they think I have all the support that I need because I have, you know, blank amount of friends or what have you, or people think I'm well liked. And so, you know, whatever, they're not going to reach out to me. And if I'm experiencing these subtle symptoms, I'm doing it all by myself. And that's where people start to feel really alone and really isolated. And that's, it's really hard to reach out for help. It's really hard to reach out for help, especially when something that you're experiencing is invisible and no one else is seeing it and no one else is feeling it. And so we have to create opportunities for people to to say, hey, I'm not doing so well. It, part, part of that kind of speaks to that stigma, I think, that I'm sure you guys you know, on your team deal with a lot uh, with mental health. Um, but part of it also, I, w- I would guess, uh, or at least what it made me think of when I heard you talking about that, is that physical health, um, for the most part, has that, that much more understood and clear trajectory of getting better, right? That's why we say, yes. I, I hope you get better soon, because we right. expect that to happen. That's what the body does. It heals from a broken leg or a cold or whatnot. We don't expect that... Um, you know, that without some type of outside help, maybe uh, it would just never get better, you know, um, totally. and, and mental health. We don't always understand that to things to work that way. Um, so, you know, let, let's start moving the conversation, maybe in a little more, more helpful or hopeful uh, manner, but w- what are some, some things that people can do as far as self self care, um, or uh, resources for someone in a loved one that they think might be struggling with this kind of stuff? Um, great question. So I, you know, my, my suggestion are a couple things. Again, reach, reach out to people. So we all have a part in, in how to better support the people around us and our community. Yeah. So that could be friends, family, neighbors, people in our church community, people at work, uh, you know, partners, spouses, children, you name it. So reach out, let people yeah. know, let people know that, that you, that you, that you see them. Like I see you're having a hard time and I'm here. The other, yeah. in another option is there are resources in Clackamas County. There are resources for folks that are literally at people's fingertips. So the Clackamas County crisis and support line 
which is a 24-7 crisis and support line, is available to people. And people need to know that that number is, is it, it used to be called a crisis line, but now it's called a crisis and support line because people don't have to be in crisis to call that line. People can call just to chat. They can call to problem solve. They can call if they're concerned about someone else. They can call if they're concerned about themselves. And the person who answers the, the, the line, they will do all the asking of the questions. They will figure out how to be of support, how to make a plan. So people don't necessarily need to know exactly the answers as to why they're calling. They just need to know that they're concerned or that they need help. And the crisis and support line number, again, it's a 24-7 number, is 503-655-8585. Again, it's uh, 503-655-8585. And that is a really great place to start to get connected to services if people are interested in that. Be, um, you know, learn more about maybe some of the resources that are available in the community. So that's a great that's a great number to have in people's cell phones. I always encourage people uh, to put it to program it in their cell phone. We have nine one one programmed in our cell phones automatically when we get a cell phone, and um, I always like to encourage people to add in the crisis and support line into their phone so you always have it. So if you ever need it, um, it's you know it's just wherever your phone is, which is typically for us you know not too far away. Uh, it's always available. Right. The other number that is always always a, a good one to have is two one one. So two one one is a is a information and referral line, and people can call two one one and get information about where they can get a food box or where they can find a temporary shelter when it gets cold and the the warming the warming centers are open. Um, Two on one knows about where those warming centers are and 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 who has capacity. Um, two on one is a great resource. They're not a crisis line, but they are a great resource for um, supports and um, again food boxes and healthcare and they they know a lot of things and they can direct you. So I would say three things are reaching out to people around you, um, remembering that the crisis and support line line for Clackamas County is always available 24-7, and that number is 503-655-8585, and then 211, which is an information and referral service that has lots of information about lots of things, depending on what you might need. Yeah, yeah. That, that call line, let's um, just talk about that for, for a quick second, uh, so people, if they, if they you know, are, are, are maybe concerned, but who's on the other end of what that? This is confidential, these are trained people that are... are you know, know yep. what they're doing or there to listen. Great question. So uh, calling, the, calling the crisis line is confidential. Uh, in fact, you don't even have to give your name if you don't want to. You can just call and say, I prefer not to give my name. And um, that, is the, that is a possibility. No one's going to force, force that out of you. Um, we'd rather have people call and, and not give their name if that's something that's, um, that's important to people than not call at all. Um, so the people who answer the crisis line are mental health professionals. So they're either qualified mental health professionals or they're qualified mental health associates, which basically means they either have a master's level uh, graduation, the master's level education level, or they have a bachelor's level um, education level, but they are uh, qualified as mental health professionals. And those are the folks who are answering the phone. And there are um, people call the crisis line crisis and support line for lots of different reasons. So again, uh, there's this myth out there in our community that people think, well, I can't call because it's not a crisis or I can't call because I'm tying up a line for someone else who might be really in crisis. And that's not true. We have lots of lines people can call. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people call um, and please don't wait to be in crisis. To call that line. We'd, we'd, we'd love to be able to be of support to you prior to people being in crisis. And if you're in crisis, we want you to call too, but we're there, we're there um, as a prevention tool as well. That's great. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. I know you've got uh, some work to get back to. Thanks for, for taking time out to, to talk to us. Um, is there anything that you'd want to add before you, we wrap up here? No, I just appreciate you spreading, spreading the information. I think the more, the more that we can relate to our community that, um, we need to continue to take care of each other. I know we're all tired, 
but um, we need to really continue to take care of each other. And that's how we're going to get through this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, just, just to anyone listening right now, like it, it is okay to struggle. A lot of us are doing it as, as Gally has said. Um, and with all the anger, with all the division um, that's in our community right now, I just want people to hear that you do matter, that people do care that um not, none of this, whatever anger you see or, or even may feel, um, all of us are, are in this together. And we, um, you know, no, no one needs to die over any of this stuff. No one should uh, be thinking of that as an option. You know, like the, I think that all of us making it through this is more important than, than anything. And if you are thinking about wanting to end your life, um, please, please, please reach out. Um, you're not alone in any of this and we, we we want you to stay here we want you to stay here and, and live and so we want to help you if you're struggling so please yeah. reach out people do care absolutely Gally, right. uh, thank you thank you uh, thank you for all your work uh, that you're doing to support people in our community you and your team yeah you too thank you very much for doing this appreciate it talk to you soon hey Frankie what are you doing ah uh, I'm trying to figure out which TV option I want to use when DirectLink turns off their video services in January of next year. It's so confusing. Do you know there's about 40 million streaming services to choose from? Which devices do they work on? What channels do they offer? Uh, no, I did not know that. But you do realize that you're probably better off than you think. If you have DirectLink's Easy Video TV now, you're already using a streaming service. But, but listen. You don't have to go this alone. DirectLink is actually helping their members transition to their next video provider. The company has an extensive informational website where you can compare popular services and they host live tutorials on streaming TV options to help you decide. Well, hold the phone. Are you saying that they're actively trying to help their members switch to a competing service? Who? who does that? <laughs> well, DirectLink does. I mean, I guess it's one more chapter in their long history of wanting the best for our community. They've actually offered free classes for the past 12 years that teach our neighbors about the latest technology and internet security practices. And don't forget, they also orchestrated that popular bingo game last year oh, yeah. that helped keep everyone entertained and connected during the lockdowns. They've also launched special programs to help keep our students connected at home during the pandemic and partnered with the city of Canby to give free Wi-Fi year round at three local parks for locals and visitors alike. Wait, DirectLink does all that? They do indeed. And that's on top of providing the best and most reliable internet and voice services in town. So. To learn more about Direct Link services or how they can help you transition to the right video service for your home, visit directlink.coop today. Are you a healthcare hero? Do you want to become one? Are you looking for a position where you are valued, your time is your own, and you have ample opportunity for growth? Marquee Companies at Hope Village in Canby, Oregon offers all of that and more. They are currently hiring nurses, caregivers, CNAs, and enrolling students in their free CNA course. From competitive wages and up to $25,000 tuition reimbursement to flexible schedules and the opportunity to make a positive impact on someone's life, Marquee at Hope Village is the right place for you. Take your career to the next level and apply now to become a value team member at Marquee at Hope Village in Canby. To learn more or apply today, text CURRENT, that's C-U-R-R-E-N-T, to 888-906-3432. And finally, we draw this episode towards a conclusion with another rendition of Can Be Then. Can Be Then is brought to you by Retro Revival. They are not your average antique shop. They're open daily. You can find them on the corner of Northwest 3rd and Grand Street in downtown Canby or connect with them on Facebook or through email at retrorevivaloc at gmail.com. 
The story of Canby is a story about the railroad. It's quite literally true that the former would not exist without the latter, at least not in the way that we know it today. In honor and recognition of that fact, we're continuing our look back at the history of the Canby Railroad Depot, believed to be the oldest railway station still standing in the entire state of Oregon. In 1933, the depot was the site of a protest by several hundred members of what was known as the Hunger Army, a group organized by the Unemployed Party, also called the Communists, whose socialist ideals became popular with many out-of-work souls during the worst parts of the Great Depression. Armed with streaming banners approved by an organization known as the Communists, the hungry marchers arrived in Canby and took lunch on the depot grounds between the railroad track and Main Street a newspaper recorded. The marchers are orderly American citizens and were treated as such. A later communist demonstration in Portland drew an estimated 6,000 people before the group trekked to the state capital in Salem in a hunger march. Sadly, the depot had been the site of a number of tragic deaths over the years, one of the most infamous coming in January 1911, when beloved local residents Mrs. W.J. Gordon was struck and instantly killed by the 7 o'clock Shasta Limited. A lone eyewitness, a Mr. W.H. Luck, said Gordon had crossed over from her home and was walking up the tracks, quote, her mind evidently being preoccupied as she paid no attention to the oncoming train at her back. Her son, Emile Gordon, was the first one to reach the body. It was his hand that first lifted the veil she was wearing and confirmed the victim was his own mother. The newspapers later recorded that though her skull had fractured and her face was not disfigured beyond some light bruising. Willing hands, although accompanied by aching hearts, were soon hurrying from all directions to the afflicted home, and everything that human aid could do was done to relieve the awful agony of the children, the Canby Tribune recorded. Mrs. Gordon had been a great favorite with the ladies and the young people of the town, and it seemed to those present that there was nothing they could do in spite of their anxiety to help. For many years, the workhorse on the Canby branch of the Southern Pacific Railroad was a steam-powered locomotive known as the 5021. Built in the mid-1920s, the 5021 provided passenger and freight service and ran the rails from east to west, always stopping at the Canby Depot along the way. It remained in operation until 1955. The Canby Depot served the community well over a century as it grew from a small farming town into a thriving, active city of more than 10,000 souls. The station served passengers as well as freight and even handled telegraph service. Mail came and went by steam and later diesel train under contract. Thousands of carloads of potatoes, grain, and other agricultural products from local farms went out by rail before and after World War I when the three largest commission offices operated here. Its stationers include Archie Markey, who served as station master for 35 years until his retirement in 1958, and Herman Bergman, longtime Southern Pacific Railroad employee who turned out the lights when the Canby Depot closed in 1975. Both were known for their many contributions to the community in which they chose to live and work. But by the late 1970s, the then 107-year-old structure had become decommissioned and was on the verge of being torn down. Fortunately, starting in 1978, a grassroots movement had started in Canby to have the depot des designated a historic structure and turned into a museum. It was the brainchild of John R. Neeland who founded the Canby Historical Society on May 15, 1968, and served as its first president, chairing meetings and organizing social events, including an annual picnic. Neeland had spent 40 years at the Canby Post Office serving as postmaster from 1959 until his retirement in August 1974. His mother, Anna Louise Hafes Nyland, who had been known and beloved across town as the owner and proprietor of the Maple Corner Restaurant. He volunteered his time to seek out old, forgotten photographs of historic significance to Canby from families, estates, and charities. Sadly, Neeland died in 1982, just a few years before seeing his dream of a local history museum housed in the restored Canby Railroad Depot could come to fruition. The movement also included members of the Canby Area Chamber of Commerce and other community organizations with assistance and support from the Canby City Council, which was tasked with seeking a historic designation for the building and Clackamas County. A Save the Depot committee headed by a local historian, Myra Weston, was formed to raise money to move and restore the historical building. 
The effort received more than $20,000 in private contributions, along with donated materials and services, and a $20,000 community development block grant. The group also used materials from a 1907 warehouse edition to repair and restore the tattered depot. It took five years, but the group eventually raised enough to remove, renovate, and relocate the aging structure three-quarters of a mile down Northwest First Avenue to its new home near the Clackamas County Fairgrounds, a journey that took almost an hour. The rechristened Canby Depot Museum was dedicated in October 1986, with Bergman serving as Master of Ceremonies and Marquis, who by then was 98 years old in attendance. Well, friends, that'll do it for another episode of Now Hear This Can Be. I'm your host, James Walton. As always, thank you for listening and have a great day. Tyler, did you know that the Australian lyrebird can mimic any sound that it hears? Even chainsaws? No, that's uh, super interesting. Did you know that a baby puffin is called a puffling? Uh, or no. that baby sea otters can't swim, so their moms wrap them up in pieces of kelp until they learn how to paddle? Wait, do you know any trivia that isn't like animal related? Not really, but here's some stuff you may not know about the Wild Hair Saloon, where Camby goes to eat and have fun. Okay. The Wild Hair is one of Camby's longest running locally owned restaurants. Owners Joan and Darren Moden have been in business for 16 years. That's cool. Yep. Yeah, heck, you were just a baby back then. I, and, wait, what? and they love to give back. They've been members of the Camby Chamber for that long, and they donate over $20,000 to local sports, FFA programs, and civic organizations each year. Wow, I'm legitimately like caught off. That's cool. Yeah. They also support more than 30 jobs in the community through their award-winning staff, some of them as young as 18. Hey, that's older than you are. Uh, dude, I'm te I'm 10 months younger than you. With, with the days getting longer and the weather getting warmer, the Canby Wild Hair's expansive outdoor patio is the place to be. Furry friends, welcome. Well, that sounds great. I'm going to go check them out just off of Highway 99E next to the Space Age in Canby at 1656 Beaver Creek Road in Oregon City or on their website at thewildhairsaloon.net. Now Hear This Canby is produced by me, Tyler Clausen. Our content director and star reporter is Tyler Frankie. And of course, our show is edited by Cameron Clausen. We also feature the vocal talents of Joy Struby and James Walden. So a round of applause to them. The song that you're hearing right now is Canby by singer-songwriter Olivia Harms, used with her permission. To find more work from her, you can visit her website, olivia13.com. Now Hear This Can Be is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. The production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned, full-service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe, and we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. Um, I will take a motion to adjourn. So I just moved it. I didn't even ask for it, though. <laughs>